My next guest is American writer, historian, actor and essayist whose acid wit has made him a hugely popular and indeed unpopular commentator. I like Gore when he's on this show. He says what is on his mind. Mr. Vidal has become a cultural icon. Prolific American novelist, playwright, screenwriter, historian, essayist. Conversationalist, actor, humorist and sometime political candidate. Would you welcome please Mr. Gore Vidal. From We Own This Town, this is Vidalatry. A look at the wit and wisdom in the spoken words of Gore Vidal. I'm Ryan Briegel. In a 1983 essay called Ronnie and Nancy, A Life in Pictures, Gore Vidal wrote, I first saw Ronnie and Nancy Reagan at the Republican Convention of 1964. Gore goes on to describe watching the Reagan couple as they themselves watch former President Dwight Eisenhower speak at the convention. Eisenhower having pushed for Governor William Scranton to try for the nomination, he would succumb to support the eventual nominee, Barry Goldwater. Gore first notices Nancy Reagan as he writes, There was her furious glance when someone created a diversion during Ike's aria. She turned, lip curled, huge unblinking eyes afire with a passion to kill the enemy at hand. For all I know, she might have been trying out new contact lenses. In any case, I had barely heard of Nancy then. Even so, I said to myself, there is a lot of rage in this little lady. Then Gore moves on to Ronald Reagan as he writes, I do remember being struck by the intensity with which Reagan studied Eisenhower. I had seen that sort of concentration a thousand times in half-darkened theaters during rehearsals. The understudy examines the star's performance and tries to figure out how it is done. An actor prepares, I said to myself. Mr. Reagan is planning to go into politics. Gore recalls the time in 1959 that Reagan had expressed interest in playing the part of a presidential candidate in Gore's play The Best Man. Gore writes, An agent had suggested Ronald Reagan for the lead. We all had a good laugh. He is by no means a bad actor, but he would hardly be convincing. But in 1980, Gore would discover just how wrong he was, as he watched the fairly good actor convince a nation that he could be the president they so needed. You might remember Gore spoke of Ronald Reagan in 1981 on the UK television show Afternoon Plus, when Gore himself was thinking of running for office. In fact, it is believed that Gore ran for the Senate in 1982 after witnessing Reagan as president for nearly two years. If Reagan could use his fame and familiarity to get elected president, why couldn't Gore at least become a senator? Do you think there's a danger in being known for being well-known? I think there is, in politics, no danger at all in being known for being well-known. I have, curiously enough, coming as I do from... I suppose the word is the left. I have exactly the same advantage as a politician that Ronald Reagan had, except that I don't have the money. He was picked by the rulers because the American people had seen him between the movies and television commercials for 50 years. And it was never whether they like him or dislike him. They're used to him. In the 1983 essay, Gore brings up what he calls the true Reagan problem, that Ronald Reagan was simple-minded and never really understood what went on from day to day in the White House, an issue which was often joked about during his presidency. Gore points out a passage in the book Make Believe, the story of Nancy and Ronald Reagan by Lawrence Lemur, in which Lemur states, What was so extraordinary was Ronnie's apparent psychic distance from the burden of the presidency. He sat in cabinet meetings doodling. Unless held to a rigid agenda, he would start telling Hollywood stories or talk about football. Gore would later joke about Reagan's supposed low intellect on a 1985 Tonight Show appearance. The good news is the election is over. (laughs) The bad news, prepare yourself. Ronald Reagan's library just burned down. Both books were destroyed. (laughs) But the real horror, he had not finished coloring the (laughs) second But perhaps more frightening was Gore's idea that Ronald Reagan was hired as an actor to play a part. The part just happened to be the leader of the free world. He spoke with UK television host Sue Lawley in 1989. I like political power, but that you do through influence. And you can be far more influential 
through speaking out to people, writing, appearing, and so on, than if you went to the Senate where you've been bought, or even to the White House. Now, Reagan's fascinating. He comes out of Hollywood. He's an actor. He is hired by the various wealthy entities that control the United States, much of it the defense business. He was elected to impersonate a president for eight years. He had no interest in the job, <laughs> no interest in the people. <laughs> he was hired to cut the taxes of the rich and keep the money going to the Defense Department and every now and then to say the Russians are coming. <laughs> Immediately after Reagan's inauguration, Gore was invited to be a guest on the Merv Griffin Show to discuss the new administration. And Gore used the opportunity to highlight Reagan's age, but also the country's very low voter turnout. We have Mr. Reagan, who's received a mandate from the people. Well, he received something. It was certainly better than the old actor's home. The White uh, House. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I were he, you know, I, to be really shrewd, he ought to let his hair go white. And just simply say, and just suddenly appear, you know, after all those years of that waxy build-up, you know, just... just <laughs> no, but he denies that, and they've come up with proof, and he hasn't touched his hair. Oh, well, maybe somebody else touches it. I don't think... <laughs> <laughs> I myself would be nervous to touch it, as it looks alive. I mean, mm. that hair looks <laughs> good. Like a there were reports of critics following Reagan to his barber to see if he dyed his hair. But apparently no one could ever offer hard proof that it wasn't all natural. Imagine a country being so concerned about a president's hair. Reagan eventually revealed the secret to his sleek shine, Brill Cream. Brill Cream, a little babble do ya? Brill Cream, you look so debonair. And judging from that jingle, Reagan had probably been using Brill Cream since the 1950s. Merv continues. Even the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, is giving him what he calls a six-month honeymoon, where, where the Democratic members of the House of Representatives are not going to attack him yeah. to give him a break going in, and you refuse to give him a break. Oh, I refuse to, yeah, yeah. Well, based on what? Uh, based on what I suppose he'll do to the country. I get a little nervous. But the people voted him in with a landslide. Which people, Merv? One in four voted for him, one in four voted against him, and two out of four didn't vote at all. This is not a mandate. This is barely a, uh, I don't know, a boy date. But whatever it is, it is not a mandate. Forgive Gore the terrible joke, because he is correct as far as voting statistics go. Only 53% of Americans of eligible voting age voted in the 1980 presidential election. The popular vote wasn't split exactly in half, as Gore suggests, but it was somewhat close, with Reagan winning 51% to Jimmy Carter's 41%. His electoral college win, however, was a little more uneven. Reagan received 489 electoral votes and carried 44 states. Carter received 49 electoral votes and carried six states. They continue, Gore slipping in a jab at Nixon. There's a large group now of ex-presidents. <laughs> Mr. Carter, yeah, Mr. Nixon Ford. Is, Nixon is at least two being schizophrenic, you know. <laughs> we have to pay for <laughs> two sets of secret service. Uh, Where is the bad Nixon today? Where is the good Nixon today, you yeah, know? Yeah. Uh, I miss him, as you know. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, no. I'm an addict. I can't get enough of Richard Nixon. I, I think he's going to be funny. <laughs> uh, when I see those jowls going on television, <laughs> when he starts talking very seriously about uh, the world affairs, and I just know, and, and he always gets sort of, <laughs> you know, the, the voice gets very, very, very tense. Mm -hmm. I just know he's going to be taking Did trips. you keep to your promise, I'm trying to remember, on this show, prior to his first election, you said on this show, if Mr. Nixon is elected, I am moving out of the country. And the people were shocked that you, and then you moved to Italy. But did you stay there the whole time? Oh, no, I came back. It got Too so much exciting. Fun? Well, huh. you don't get very good uh, TV reception of Nixon in Italy. I suddenly found I couldn't live without it. Ah. Now, this is my worry about uh, Ron and Nancy, is I think we could become addicted again. You know, you get so you can sort of count the chins and... Uh, but we might be in better hands. And watch hands. her stare. Uh, he did rather well for the state of California. Well, yes, he ambled along through the governorship. Uh, he First time we ever had a surplus in the state treasury. A surplus, which was achieved <coughs> by the largest uh, tax increase in the history of California. <laughs> then but he gave it back to the people? Just before the next election, and he ah. kept a lot of it for the government. You know. <laughs>
it is true that when Reagan was elected governor of California in the 1966 election, he immediately approved a major state tax increase to take care of a budget deficit that, of course, he had not caused. When complaints came in about the tax increase, Reagan blamed the previous governor, Pat Brown. But when the tax increase resulted in a budget surplus in the years that followed, Reagan credited his administration's own management skills. But then Gore brings up what worried him about Reagan the most. Because he wants to add $30 billion to the defense budget against uh, godless, atheistic, uh, monolithic communism, which is forever on the march, even now as we sit here. Mm. And this money, by divine right, has to go to the Pentagon. Yeah. And he does this sort of shell game with the people. $30 billion will be added to the defense budget here, and then, of course, uh, the taxes will be lowered over here. But he said he will get government off the backs of the people. I wonder where he will then put it. Ah. <laughs> More interesting, perhaps, was when Gore appeared on the late-night talk show of someone he truly considered a friend, Johnny Carson. In 1981, Gore was Johnny's guest on The Tonight Show at the end of the year, right before Christmas. Gore just said, what an act to follow, uh... I feel such an air of depression as, as I entered after that, all that excitement. Nobody told me that you wanted me to bring my lizard because it's on short notice and my lizard has his own television program. That's right. It's called Firing Line. Firing Line. Oh, you're starting already. I'm starting already right from the top. And after the obligatory joke about William F. Buckley Jr. and Buckley's show Firing Line, Carson plays a game asking Gore what he would give to certain people for Christmas. Just, just for the fun of it, I put down a list of names. And if, if, you were, if it were in your power as Santa Claus this year to bring certain people certain things, I'm just going to throw you a name, and if you don't have anything for them, yeah. uh, what would you bring, for example, uh, the First Lady, Nancy Reagan? Nancy Reagan. I almost said it, I almost said it like Ron. Nancy. Uh, <laughs> Nancy's been a good girl this year. I'm going to give her Versailles. <laughs> whole palace. She can paint it red. You know, that her Nancy's red. And, of course, she has the Marie Antoinette Award for the year as well. That would okay. be my gift for Nancy. Often referred to as Fancy Nancy, Nancy Reagan was regularly ridiculed for her lavish spending in the White House. $200,000 for China, $800,000 for redecorating, and accepting $1 million in designer clothes for free all during a time of high unemployment and a generally poor economic state. So Gore comparing Nancy Reagan living in the White House to Marie Antoinette living in Versailles probably wasn't too far off the mark. Next up, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi. How about uh, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya? Gaddafi, not wishing him well <laughs> at the Yuletide season, I would give him the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> they cost us $10 billion a year. They are absolutely, whatever they touch is a mess. They are too expensive. I'd like Gaddafi to own the CIA. Just take Langley and send it to him. First, they will bankrupt Libya. Secondly, they will probably overthrow him. And they'll be off our backs. So you'll have $8 billion well, extra money. Let him try to money. figure out what's going on. Exactly. <laughs> you are in the Yuletide spirit, aren't you? Next up, Secretary of State Alexander Haig. How about Alexander Haig? Alexander Haig, I have listened to, or tried to listen to now, for ever since he's been Secretary of State. Since I have not understood a word that he has said, <laughs> I am sending him to Berlitz to learn English. <laughs> After that, we will know what's really there or not. They call it, ha is it Haigies or Haigisms that they have coined now? I guess... Uh... He well, does, the syntax does get a little... Uh... Well, it's beyond English. Uh, it's beyond Eisenhower, because Eisenhower at least was deliberately misleading, you know, and he, he always had a plan, but this man just seems, and he looks at you, you know, and begins that stare. I get prioritize, want to prioritize things. Prioritize, yeah, and rushes into the room. I wouldn't like to be George Bush if anything, heaven help us, should ever happen to Ron. <laughs> George Bush might find a little shoot-up in the old office as Alexander the Great strides forward to his destiny. First serving as White House Chief of Staff for Nixon and Ford, Alexander Haig was nominated to be Reagan's Secretary of State. But many senators had misgivings concerning Haig's involvement in the Watergate scandal and were wary about confirming him. But Haig was eventually confirmed, 
and throughout his time as Reagan's Secretary of State, many strange statements were attributed to him, resulting in the terms Hagism and Hageldegook. Haig is reported to have uttered statements that either didn't make much sense, such as, quote, the warning message we sent to the Russians was a calculated ambiguity that would be clearly understood. They were redundant, as in his oft-repeated phrase, careful caution. Or they were simply incorrect, as when Reagan was shot in March of 1981 and Haig announced, as for now, I am in control here. At the time, Vice President George Bush was away from Washington, D.C., but in actuality, the line of succession went first to the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, then to the pro tempore of the Senate, Strom Thurmond, and then, fifth on the list, the Secretary of State. Gore Vidal's concern about Reagan as an actor searching for a war would come up time and time again, as it does at the end of the Tonight Show interview. It shows a president, like many before, that needed the United States to have a war with anyone in order to justify our high levels of defense spending. About the, uh, the real, real subjects like why it is that we're always at war with somebody. Where, 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 where did this enemy of the week come from? It's Nicaragua this week, it was Salvador the week before. We were going to overthrow Gaddafi at one point, and the CIA said, no, 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 it wasn't Libya, it was Mauritania. And the Mauritanians then got on the phone, why are you trying to overthrow us, you know? Where does this come from? And it comes from something very simple that you saw in Reagan's budget. He said over the next five years, we're going to spend one and a half trillion dollars on defense. That's a thousand billion, right? That's a thousand billion. It is more money. Now, where's the war? Who's the enemy? They have to keep looking around. So they start they talk about the vulnerability window. I love that. Even, even Reagan broke himself up on that one. He was giving one of his interviews, and he said, well, I mean, the Russians are ahead of us here and there, and then there's this vulnerability window. And even he broke up on it and started to chuckle at his own cue cards. <laughs> Gore ends his 1983 essay on Ronnie and Nancy with a sobering thought. As he writes... What is important is that in a dangerous world, the United States, thanks to a worn-out political system, has not a president, but an indolent cue card reader, whose writers seem eager for us to be, as soon as possible, at war. To the extent that Reagan is aware of what is happening, he probably concurs. But then what actor, no matter how old, could resist playing the part of a wartime president? The irony of Gore Vidal using the phrase wartime president in 1983 is that only 17 years later, the United States would be entering a new century, led by a man who was clearly not an actor, but would very proudly take on the self-assigned title of wartime president. Vidolatry is brought to you by We Own This Town. This episode was written and produced by me, with additional research by Joshua Reese. You can find more information about this episode at vidolatry.com. I'm Ryan Briegel. Thank you for listening. <laughs>